Thank you. Amazing. Hey, it's really good to be here today. And uh, it is great to see the four faces that are here. But uh, man, those empty chairs, right? And those empty chairs, to me, as I sit here and look at you who are here, but also I see those empty chairs, I know that they, there's people who usually sit there, and I just love them too, so much, and I miss their face, and so maybe a huge Zoom me, I don't know what we could do, but, but I, I love that you guys here, but also just saying, missing those others who are not here. Today... We're going to do something, as I've said in this series, Grace 2020, I'm going back a little bit to before I was actually uh, full-time, part-time here. I'm, I'm, people ask what I do. I say I'm a part-time, full-time pr- preacher, kind of. And, uh, but before I, that, I, I did preach a series in 2016 about grace. And in it, I introduced to, to us this Matt Chandler video. And that Matt Chandler video has kind of been a thing for us. We've all enjoyed it. It's been uh, really, in some ways, uh, helped root us in uh, grace. And we're going to look at that today. What we're going to do, I'm going to break it down. And uh, I thought about that term, break it down. Sometimes that's what we're just, that's what we're going to do. We're going to break down Ephesians 4, uh, 1 and we're going to break down Matt Chandler both. And so that's what we're getting ready to do, and uh, we're not going to listen to the video today. I know that some of you are going to miss Matt's voice. Steve's already kind of, you know, given me the shrug that, okay, you try it, whatever. But I'm going to read it today just to give it a different kind of feel, and maybe you hear the words a little bit differently, and and maybe it'll enrich what we've uh, done so far, uh, not diminish. That's what we're hoping for anyway, Steve. But uh, we're going to begin by reading Ephesians 1, uh, verses 4 through 8. And so that's the foundation for Matt's video. And so here we go, starting in verse 4. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given to uh, given to us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Man, so packed with meaning, all of those words. And so we're going to break it down and then we're going to break it down again. So we're going to start breaking down. I'm going to say break it down a lot today, I guess. We're going to start with doing that uh, with the scripture, Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And and that, as you, you may have heard this before, but uh, that's what I just read to you is part of one sentence. All of that's one sentence in Greek. As a matter of fact, that sentence extends several more verses. But if the words are so meaningful, we're going to break them down. And so, first of all, we're going to hit this idea that God's, whoops, back it up. God lavishes. So we're headed to lavish, Steve, and we're all going to try and say it the best we can. Uh, Matt Chandler imitation in, in a few minutes, but not yet. He lavishes his grace upon us. And so what does that, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it says he chose us. And so I want you to think about this. Have you ever been chosen? Have you ever been chosen? Or, or more, maybe this, have you ever been not chosen? Have you ever been not chosen? Have you ever been left out or overlooked? or ignored. So when you hear this verse, to me, there's a power to it when it says, I've been chosen. Yes, I'm chosen. And and so what? I've been chosen, it says, in him before the creation of the world. He chose you 
before you chose him. He chose you long before you ever were that twinkle in your mama's eye. He chose you before he knit you together in your mother's womb. He chose you. And then he chose you what? To be holy and blameless in his, in his sight. Now, I wanted to say this holy and blameless has to do with our character. He chose you to be like this. He didn't just choose you for nothing. I, I, I have been chosen before to, be, to have certain roles. And some in sports, you know. I'm supposed to, and I was, I was chosen one time to hold the water for the guys who were actually playing, <laughs> okay? You know what was my job? Hold the water. He chose you to do something to be holy and blameless. He chose you to be. This is part of your character. So he's choosing for you this character. And we're going to talk about that character next week. As a matter of fact, we're going to, well, we're going to break it down, uh, that, those words, holy and blameless. But that was God's design. And that was God's desire for us to be holy and, and blameless. And so kind of going on from that, in love, he predestined us. This is back to his plan, his, his design. He, he predestined us to be adopted as his children through Jesus Christ because of his pleasure and will. So our character, holy and blameless, our identity, child of God. That's who I am. That's me. That's my identity. He chose me to have this character, and he also chose me to be this person, this identity. And, and we're not just children. We're chosen children. We're chosen children. So adopting us, he gave us character, our character, holy and blameless, and our identity, his child. And it says, because of his pleasure and will, he is happy to do that. God gets pleasure choosing you. I mean, I'm thinking about this as I, at certain times in my life and careers, I had the opportunity to choose. And, you know, I loved when I was in playing football, I was a coaching football, and we would recruit players, and I loved to be able to recruit players with talent. Those are much better than the ones that, you know, hey... <laughs> But once you got them all to your team, they're all on your team, and you get this guy, and he's a great talent in high school, he played both ways. He played defense and he played offense. I was a defensive back coach. You know what gave me great pleasure is when a great skill player got to play defense. <laughs> he got to be mine. He gave me great. I was happy about that. He's on my, I get to coach him. He's on my squad. So choosing you Gave God great pleasure. He's happy to have you on his team. And it says that he did this to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely gives us in the one he loves. Now, again, we could spend a whole sermon breaking down that one verse. But I just want to say this to the praise. He gets the credit for this plan. This was his plan. It's a good plan. And he gets the credit for his plan to, for us to be on his team, have identity as his child, and have the character of, of, of blameless. I, I, we'll get to that next week, but <laughs> holy and blameless, my character. So, next verse. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins because of the riches of God's grace. Again, Wow, this, this verse is so packed. He bought us out of slavery. Uh, redemption is slavery vocabulary. It's vocabulary that's talking about slave trading. I'm going to redeem you. And in this case, it took blood. Think back to the video we just watched for communion. It took blood that he bought me. I was a slave to sin, and he bought me. He redeemed me. Through his blood, he gave me the forgiveness of sins. Now, forgiveness gives us freedom from our slavery and addiction to sin. This is implying that we are slaves of sin, getting ready to be redeemed and forgiven, and we need to be set free from our sin. 
Because sin is responsible. Sin in our life is responsible for our brokenness, for our broken relationships. It's responsible for our broken dreams, for our broken value system. You know, it, it's, re, it's responsible for our, our sadness. It, it, it's responsible for the negative things in our life. Sin is because we have chosen and become addicts, slaves of sin, and what he has done is redeemed us and forgiven us. Sin cultivates this desire that I would have in me for things that won't satisfy me, and i got to be set free from that addiction. And so through his blood, he buys me. Redemption and forgiveness sets us free. This is, by the way, good news. Can we say this is good news that he has done this for all of us? He's chosen us. He's redeemed us. He's forgiven us. And, and this is what Paul says before Matt did. Paul said this, that he lavished on us. This is his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And I just want to look at the term understanding there. In other words, God knew what he was doing. God didn't think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set these people free by sending my son Jesus. And then I think, oh, man, I didn't think about that. No, he, he understood what he was getting ready to do. And so these are the verses that are the foundation, really, of what Matt uh, Chandler has done uh, in many ways for many other people, but specifically for us. And so we get to the Matt uh, Pat part, and he calls his video, uh, he calls it forgiveness. And so <clears throat> I'm going to read it. You know, you think it's, it's Matt is not the only one that can say these words. <laughs> and I'm not going to say it exactly like him, but, you know, if you want to chime in in a place you think it's good, uh, that's okay with me. And then we're going to come back and break down a few of these phrases too. But first of all, here is me not doing a Matt Chandler imitation, but reading some of his stuff that he wrote when he, when he ingested and digested, when he ruminated, when he reflected, when he got Ephesians 1, 4 through 8 in his head and heart, this is what came out. Okay, so here it is. He says, our default position as strugglers is to believe that God is disappointed and frustrated, that he is simply tolerating us. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 says, no. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, he was going to adopt you and make you holy and blameless in his sight. So whether in difficult days or good days, God is at work. He has not abandoned you in this difficult season. And right here he shouts. I'm not going to, but you can imagine him, but I want you to hear it my way. How amazing does that make our God? How amazing. In our hypocrisy, he is long-suffering with us. In our inability to live out all that he has called us to, he continues to lavish upon us his grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. So I love this word, lavish. <laughs> and here's Matt, well, okay. Extravagant, over the top. And so now when the Bible is talking about forgiveness, it's saying that his grace and forgiveness is lavished. It's too much. Like, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous amount. It's, it's way too much. It's over the top. It's out of control. Yeah. Man or woman of God in Christ, but struggling? God does not regret saving you. He doesn't regret it. You have not surprised him. You cannot surprise God and, and God is not watching you now, watching where you are, watching you how you've struggled this week, watching how you stumble and fall, and regretting his decision to pay the price for you in full. You have no sin, past, present, or future, that has more power than the cross of Jesus Christ. None. This means your salvation wasn't just a past event alone, 
but that Christ, even now, is continuing to save you. He didn't forgive your past sins, and now leaving it up to you to conquer present and future sins. Which means, it doesn't matter how you came in here this morning, you do not disgust Him. Well, you may say, well, Bob, you don't know what I struggle with, and you don't know how deplorable it is. Hmm, I know this. Jesus would say that he paid the bill in full, so what you're saying is nonsense. That is the grace with which he lavished on us his forgiveness. Man, that's good. <laughs> Isn't that good? But we're going to break it down a little bit. We're still going to break it down a little bit more. Uh, because some of these phrases, I, I just want to hit them, kind of hit them again. And so one is, this, in our inability to live out all that he has called us to, he continues to lavish upon us his grace. So this idea of the inability, the idea that we can't do it, God has called us to do something, and I think he's equipped us to do it, but we don't. So we don't do it, everything that he asks us to do. But he says this, He's called us to it, and he continues to lavish upon us his grace. And so I want you to think about this. His grace is not like probation, or it's not like a second chance. You know, this is a thing, and we often say that grace is like getting a second chance. No, it's not. It's like getting all the chances. Like when he asked the, the guys, his boys ask him, Jesus, they asked Jesus, how often, how much should we forgive? Maybe seven times? Like, they thought, wow, that's going to be a lot. No, he said seven times 70. You got so many times. Meaning, infinitely. You're just going to keep on forgiving. You're not getting a second chance. You're getting a third, fourth. He, he knows that you have an inability to do everything he's called us to. It's not a three strikes and you're out program. Now then, it's also not... Forgetting that the goal is holiness. Okay? He's not saying, oh, it doesn't matter. It's okay. You've sinned and it doesn't matter. No, he's not saying that. It mattered. Jesus isn't on the cross saying, hey, guys down there, it doesn't matter. It's cool. I know you, you crucified me. You didn't know what you're doing, and so it's okay. He's not saying it's okay. He's saying, I forgive you, which is a whole different thing than saying, it's okay. Okay? Oops. <laughs> so, that's, that's in our inability. He continues, though, to lavish the grace upon us. And so he gets to the word lavish. And this is just crazy, right? So, what does he mean? He, and he tries to define it himself. He's throwing out all these different kind of words, but... You know, so I'm looking it up, and he's using all the words that are looked up to, you know. So you look in all the dictionaries, he's used all these words. Uh, but he, he gets kind of going crazy there, and it's like it's out of control. God, God's grace. And to me, the point is, how much grace does God have? Well, he's got enough, right? He's not going to run out. Sometimes I think uh, in, in our kind of world where it's supply and demand, Right? If you run out of supply, you're going to have people fighting over it. Right? And his grace isn't like that. His grace is not going to run out. When I get to the front of the line, he's going to have plenty for me. So he's not going to run out. He's got a lot. And so he can lavish. How much gray grace does he have? And so then he gets to this part where he's saying this. He doesn't regret saving you. Meaning that, okay, he saved Bob. He, died, he sent Jesus, died on the cross, and, and he saved me. And, and now he sees I'm not living up to my salvation. And so he said, man, I wish I hadn't saved Bob. I mean, it's okay. I can save Mike and Jeanette because they're okay. But Bob, he's just, he's done it over and over and over, and I'm done with him. You know, he's not, he's not like that. And, and Matt's saying that's not it. And he's, he's saying this about surprising God. You know, I wonder... Like, God being surprised at sin, like, oh my gosh, I didn't see that coming. I mean, God's not surprised at us when we sin. 
When, when I am feeling the need to not own up to what I've done, there's a temptation for me to lie. God is not surprised that that temptation for me to lie comes. He's not surprised when I lie. Oh, God's not surprised at any of our sin. And so he's not regretting thinking, you know, I made a mistake here by sending Jesus. And that's what Matt's saying. You can't surprise God. He's, he knows what he's done. He knows what you're going to do. And so, next is, yeah. He's not watching you now. Watching, this is what Matt says, how you stumble and fall and are regretting the decision to pay the price for you in full. When you understand that God is always watching you, is this good news or bad news to you? Okay, so think about that for a second. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you, if you know that God's watching you, you think this could be bad news? Yeah, you know, a little bit, like, because I wish he wouldn't see that. Because I'm going to do something wrong. But on the other hand... I want him to be there when I fall off the road, you know. Uh, right now, I'm driving a rental car that yesterday uh, it had a low tire, low air in my tire. And I, I put the tire, I put air in it yesterday evening, and I got in it to drive over. And as I'm driving over, I'm thinking, I wonder about that tire, you know, and I always, I always think that one of these days I'm going to be somewhere between Cisco and Weatherford, and I'm going to have car trouble. And what am I going to do? At that moment, I'm hoping God is watching me, and He's putting air back in my tire, or whatever it is. Don't right? You're wanting God to watch you to help you. You're not wanting Him to watch, but He's like this. God's not watching you. This is what Matt's saying. He's not watching you and seeing how you. Oh, I saw that, Betty. You shouldn't have done that. You took your mask off for 30 seconds, you know, quit it, you know. God's not like that, trying to out to catch you doing something wrong. And, or he's not out to see, oh, gosh, Bob did that again. I, I wish I would not have saved him. He's not regretting paying the price for you. Your salvation, also, this is such good news to me. Your salvation is not a past event, okay? It's not something that happened in the past alone, and now you're on your own. But he says God is, that Jesus is continuing to save you. You're going to keep fighting sin and temptation all of your life. And he's in you, he's in you fighting the fight with you. He's not just leaving it up to you. You're on your own. Hey, get after it. So I remember when I was baptized, I was 10 years old, and uh, we were in the, it was in the summertime, and my dad baptized me in a church of just a little bit bigger than this, not, not much bigger than this, the Fort Sam Houston Church of Christ. And I told my parents I was going to get baptized uh, that night at church, because we had church on Sunday nights then. <clears throat> and uh, so they were ready for me to go, and on those days we had an invitation song where you'd walk to the front if you needed to be baptized or somebody pray for you. Uh, and so uh, they were ready for me. The sermon was over. We were singing the song, All Things Are Ready, number seven in the old blue book. <laughs> and so my parents were there, and I was standing, I was ready to go, and and I thought, I'm waiting till the second verse. Uh, and so, you know, people look like, okay, Bob, you know, time, time to go. And so, but then I did, and my dad baptized me. I got back there. We're putting on the changing clothes, putting on the baptism clothes. And they had a top and some bottoms to get. And there was no clean top. So I, I was embarrassed because I was getting my, I was being baptized with no shirt on in my little church. And it was great. But here's what happened. That night, and for the next, I, I thought, I was done with sin. I'm 10 years old. I think, I will never sin again. I am completely done with that. It's over. God saved me, and here I am, a new man, or a 10-year-old man. And, and here I go. Well, a few days later, I felt myself getting some of the same sins I had done before that I had recognized in myself. 
And those have to do with being angry or lying or different things, being dishonest or, you know, hurting my sisters or, you know, stuff like that. And, and what happened is I thought, well, well, okay, I did it. I did one, but I'm not ever going to do that again. Well, then a few days, weeks later, and then more often and more often, I found myself sinning just like I was when I was nine. And I thought, uh-oh. And so what I'm tempted to do is give up at that point, right? I, I did what I could do. Over for me. And this is what Matt's saying. He didn't forgive your past sins, and now he's leaving it up to you to take care of all your present and future sins. He's not like that. He's with you all the way. All the way. And so this is what it means. God can rescue. God can save. I want to close with this quote from Max Licato. So I go from Matt Chandler to Max Licato. Both good guys to quote, by the way. And so this is what, I think this helps sum up our situation. And we're going to sing. And, and the song we're going to sing is, again, just, I, I feel like it's us responding back to God what he said through Matt and through the scriptures to us this morning. But here's what Max says. Our Savior kneels down and gazes upon the darkest acts of our lives. Again, you're not surprising God. But rather than recoil in horror, he reaches out in kindness and says, and says, I can clean that if you want. And doesn't that paint a picture for you? Loving, all-powerful creator God who's also a father who sees our mess. He sees it. And he's not horrified. Instead, he says in kindness, I can clean that if you want. I can clean that if you want. And so along with Matt Chandler, Max also, this is the grace with which he lavished on us his forgiveness. Let's sing. Weak made strong through the Savior's love. Amen. Amen. Here, here's, here's the thought. Uh, I don't know who's really this, made this quote, but the first person I ever heard say it was Max Licato. God loves you just the way you are, but too much to let you stay that way. And next week, we're going to be talking about the sanctifying grace of God, that he is changing you and transforming you. But right now, this thought, this phrase we just sang, faultless, stand before the throne. That 10-year-old boy, and the 67-year-old man both stand before the throne faultless. So do you because of God's wonderful grace. So let's go live that way, okay? See you next week.